Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. So today we begin our stewardship challenge. Those of you, if you didn't grow up in church, um, let me just back up a little bit and explain. It costs money to turn power on in a, in a building like this. It costs money to, to um, produce materials for Sunday school or for youth materials or anything that Katie spoke about in that video. And so what we try to do in the church is, um, is we have what we call our pledge campaign, our, our annual pledge campaign. And it's an opportunity where we take an opportunity in the church to continue to cast a vision of who we are, to continue to cast a vision of, of what God is calling us to be in the community in the upcoming year. And so that's kind of what we're starting today. It's that season of us reminding ourselves of who we are and reminding ourselves of what we are all about. And so what you saw on your, on your seat as you came in was um, an explanation of the kindness cards that we've talked about. I'll talk a little bit more about those at the end of my message. But also you saw the, the pledge um, form. And so that's an opportunity for you to, to participate in the mission of God here at Gainesville First United Methodist Church. And so, you know, I don't, I don't beat around. I try to be as transparent as there, as there is. You know, when I, you know, when you, when you, or in a situation like I was in before I came here and we were in a church plant and, you know, and folks that are brand new to the faith and you start talking about money and they go, yep, that's, that's why I didn't want to be a part of the church because I'm going to talk about money. And I mean, I get that. I totally get that. But, uh, but I do want to be as real and transparent and authentic as we can as we go through this journey to talk about, you know what, God is calling us to do some great things in this community and in the world. And I'll share some of those things coming up in this today and upcoming Sundays. But as we do that, we, God does that through us. And God's calling us to be the church in this community and around the world, and he does so through us. And so that's why this is. This series is just a simple reminder of who we are called to be as a church. Now, for church members, this is not an excuse for you to lay out for the next three weeks. Um, but, it's all, but it's also a renewed commitment on your part, a renewed commitment on who God's called you to be and how God has called you to partner with the church as we move forward. So that's, that's where we're at. And, and I know in the past we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about stewardship. And, and, you know, and, and the Bible does have a lot to talk about. You know, stewards are those who've been entrusted with something, to take care of something. You know, we're called to be stewards of creation, stewards of the earth, that we've been entrusted with, with something valuable to take care of. So that's a role that we play, right? I mean, we play that role. You know, we, we're stewards of our children. We don't think about it that way, but we are because at, at some point our children are going to leave the house. And, and so we've been entrusted with their, they've been entrusted in our care for a certain season of a time. And eventually they will leave and, and go and, and do their thing. So, so that's the idea of stewards. But I want to switch a little bit during this series. And I want to talk about generosity because I think, I don't think I know that a generous heart is what's going to make a difference in our world. So as we begin this generosity um, challenge, this generosity talk, we have to, we have to all uh, figure out what is our part in that, if it is a part. Maybe, maybe you're sitting here saying, you know, I don't have a part in that. And, and you know, and we'll talk through that. But, but I do believe that if, if God's called you to be a follower of Jesus, he's do, he does so within the context of a, a, a particular community. And, and that's why God has placed you here at a, at a certain time to participate in what God is doing in the life of this church. And, and so we've asked our leaders, even including our staff, myself included, we've asked all of our leaders to, to, to have a conversation among themselves because we want to lead by example. And so before we even began this journey, um, before we introduced this journey today, we've already been talking about this with our leadership. And, and so we asked our leaders to take the first step. So as of Thursday, I just, again, want to be transparent and open. So as of Thursday, we've had 42 pledge cards turned in, 42 pledge cards from our leadership turned in with a commitment of $633,410. Now, that's great. I celebrate that. But let me tell you what I celebrate even more is that 17 of those were increased pledges from the year before. And so they're believing in what God is doing in the life of our church, and they're investing in what God is doing in the life of our church, and we celebrate that. So imagine if all of us 
figured out what role God is asking us to play. And I don't know what that is for you. But I imagine if, if we, we took the time to really pray and discern and fast and seek, what is, God, what is God calling me and my family to take part of in getting God's mission to the, to, out to Gainesville and to the ends of the earth? Where do I play into that? Imagine ha- just simply having that conversation. And maybe that's where you need to start. Right, just right there, very basic, having that simple of a conversation. God, or what role do you want me to play in all of this? It reminded me of a story from the Gospel of Mark. And we have, we have four books in the Bible that tell us the story of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We spent a lot of time the last four weeks, five weeks, looking at the Gospel of Luke. There's a story in the Gospel of Mark that I find very interesting. It's almost, it really is humorous. It's, it's comical in the way it, it works itself out. But here's the story. It's in Mark chapter 2, starting with verse 1. When he returned to Capernaum, After some days, it was reported, this is Jesus, when he comes back to Capernaum, that after some days, it was reported that he was at home, which is fascinating because we didn't really think Jesus had a home. But Mark says he was at home. Maybe it was Peter's house. It could have been Peter's mother-in-law's house. We're not sure, but but somewhere that Jesus found and, and set up residence in Capernaum. So many gathered around that there was no so so many gathered around there that was so there was no longer room for them not even in the front door and he was speaking the word to them then some people came bringing him bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd they removed the roof above him they did what They removed the roof above him, and after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes, that is those who were in charge of the religious law, those who interpreted the religious law for the people, that's the scribes. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your heart? What is it e- which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up, take your mat, and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and you go home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Now I want you to imagine that we as a church lived out our faith in such boldness and such creativity that the community around us began to say, I have never seen anything like that. Let us pray. Father, we just pray that you will speak to our hearts today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing unto you. And Lord, may we all walk out of here saying, surely, surely we have met with God. That's our prayer and our longing in Jesus' name. Amen. Reynolds Price was a professor at Duke University, and middle-aged Duke uh, professor at Duke University. He was also a Southern novelist, and life was really good for Dr. Price until one day he got the news that an eight-inch tumor had wrapped around his spine. An operation was too risky. Physicians agreed that he had no longer than around 18 months to live. The pain itself became devastating. In the midst of all of that, Reynolds began to pray and to read his Bible. One day in prayer, he began to have a vision. And in his vision, Price saw himself by the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus was there calling him into the water. He writes, Jesus silently took a handful of water, poured it over my head and back until it ran down my puckered scar And then Jesus spoke to me, and he said, your sins are forgiven. And he turned to the shore, done with me. 
Reynolds continues, I came up behind him thinking in my, my standard greedy fashion, Jesus is not my sins that I'm worried about. So to Jesus, rescinding back, Reynolds says, I had the gall to say, but am I cured? And he turned to, to face me, no sign of a smile, and finally he said two words, that too. Yeah, that too. And then he climbed up out of the water, not looking around, and this time he was really done with me. Reynolds was never healed. He, his cancer eventually diminished due to his treatments, but he remained in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. A few years after the experience, Price wrote, I am still fully filled with gratitude. Gratitude because he knew the sickness he was experiencing was not linked to any particular sin. I'll never forget the, the time that I wasn't a believer. I didn't grow up in church. I wasn't, and it wasn't until later in my teenage years that I was exposed to the faith, and it was through the exposure of my grandfather. My grandfather had been diagnosed with cancer, and, and I watched as, as he, as a man of faith, went through this journey. But I'll never forget, as someone who was trying to figure out this faith thing and this Jesus thing and this God stuff, I was standing in, in his hospital room, and I'll, I'll always remember this, this lady, I'm sure she had good intentions, who walked in, and she, she looked at him, and she said, Jack, what sins do you need to confess of right now so God can heal you? I wanted to do bad things to her. Because if there was anyone who was closest to God that I'd ever seen, it was him. If, there was, if there, I wanted to see an embodiment of faith, it was him. And for someone who was trying to figure all of this out, to hear that language connecting with what he went through. But then I continued to watch what he went through. And I continued to watch how he went through it with grace and humility and strength and courage. And by the time he passed away, I was convinced that this God stuff had to be real. Not because he was healed. Not because he was restored back to health, because he wasn't. But because the way he went through it. Because of the courage that I saw. And when I saw that, I knew that there had to be something genuine. You can't fake your way and still have the grace that he had. And later... Through that experience, I would come to commit my life to Jesus Christ. Gratitude. Gratitude because whatever it was, God was with him. We pray for healing, but what maybe what we need is wholeness. And the Bible story that we read today, the, these, these fellas, they... they they come looking for healing for their friend. But what they walk away with is so much more. I want you to just imagine this scene, if you will. I mean, these four friends, they, they show up carrying their paralyzed friend who's laid out on a mat. They heard that Jesus, the healer, was in town. They arrive at this house. We don't know if it's his house or Peter's house, but he was at a house that he felt comfortable at. And everybody else knew that he would be at that house. So they come and bombard him at that house. And it's packed full of people. So full that you couldn't even get inside. You know, I, I don't know about you, but, you know, usually when I see someone in a, in a wheelchair or I see someone having difficulty walking, I try to be courteous and step aside or I try to be, you know, I try to be respectful for that in and, and, and that situation. But these, guys, these folks are like, no, 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 I was here first. I'm in line. I'm not getting out of line. I'm, you know, we were packed into that place. They were packed full into that house. So these four friends, and I, so again, putting myself in their shoes, I'd be like, well, dude, we tried. We tried. We just couldn't. But they didn't, they didn't stop them. So they got back together. They, they kind of got together. Okay, we came here to get him in front of Jesus. How are we going to do it? I imagine a little bird sitting on the roof or something, I don't know, that draw their attention to the roof. And they just look up. I got a plan. Wouldn't you like to be the person who said, I got a plan? And said, we're going to go up there. And somehow they get a ladder, they get to the top of the roof, and, and you, it just can you imagine the scene? So here they are. I don't know, I mean, roofs are pretty expensive, right? And so, and, and they're tearing a roof off of somebody's house that it didn't belong to them. 
And, and so I, I can just imagine, here's Jesus. There, he's sitting, he's standing down or sitting down. He's speaking, talking to the people. It's so packed, and all of a sudden you feel dirt just kind of sprinkle on your head. At first, you'd be like, oh, man, what was that, you know? And then all of a sudden, the sun would come through. You, the, the, you have a ray of sunlight come through. And it's like, oh, I didn't know that Peter put a sunroof in his house. And then, then the next thing you know, this roof, this, this hole just keeps getting bigger and bigger to the point it got so large that they were able to take this man who's on a mat and lower him down right in front of Jesus. Here's the thing. One thing that we discover when you read about Jesus through the Gospel of Mark is that that is the kind of faith that he's looking for. Jesus admires that risk-taking, boundary-breaking faith. We see it in his encounter with the Syrophoenician woman. It's a crazy story. If you've never read it, it's an amazing story. But, but Jesus has this encounter with this woman who's not a Jew. And she's bringing her daughter to be healed to Jesus. And, and Jesus basically calls her a dog. And she's, oh, no, 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 no. We ain't going there, preacher man. Because even the dogs have got to eat. And Jesus is like, such faith, such faith. And, and then a little bit later, you, you, you keep going and you go and following Jesus in this journey. And, and he's walking through and he's walking through this town. And there's this blind fellow by the name of Barnabas who's, who's sitting beside the, the roadside. And he hears the commotion and he hears the word Jesus. And he knew Jesus, the healer, was in town. And he starts hollering, Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me. I mean, you don't do that. I mean, he's Methodist. We're quiet. We don't loud. You know, we got to keep it calm. But he screamed louder and louder and louder, and he kept getting louder. And finally, the disciples had to go over and said, dude, you got to be quiet. But he got Jesus' attention. It's a faith that refuses to give up when there are roadblocks. It's a faith that is creative. It's a bold, audacious faith that tears roof off of establishments to get people to Jesus. That's the faith he's looking for. And that's the kind of faith that I want us to live out here at Gainesville First United Methodist Church. That's the kind of faith that I want us to take into our communities and into the world. This bold, audacious, creative faith. Two weeks ago, I spent, uh, I spent uh, uh, four days in Tampa with, with our bishop and two other bishops and, and a handful of district superintendents which or other like boss people, if you don't know Methodist tradition, and, and so and some other pastors. We were all there, and, and that's what we talked about. If we're going to reach people that no one else is reaching, then we've got to have a bold, creative faith. A faith that is not afraid to tear off roofs of establishments that are keeping people away from God. As we begin this season of discussing generous giving and generous life, I want us to challenge one another. I want us to be those four. I want you to find your other three who will help you carry the, the mat of your friend. I want us to be that, that church that, in, that encourages and supports one another and will serve as a team and how we live out our faith. I want you to have that creative determination that refuses to stop until all of our friends and all of our coworkers and all of our family members are able to be present in front of Jesus. We got three missionaries overseas that are doing that right now that we have a, have a hand in supporting and encouraging. The Madsons. The Madsons in Honduras have created a vocational school that will give skills to those who are leaving and entering the world outside of those orphanage walls. And they're doing some phenomenal work. And because of your generosity, there's this school that is there that is able to help these kids as they transition out of the orphanage. And they transition out of the orphanage with a skill where before they were just put out on the streets. We want to take that step one step further and as we propose a budget to you, one of the things that's included in that budget is that we're, that we're going to come along Karen as she hires a social worker that will work with both the women and the, the, the girls and the boys. 
and helping them enable them to see life and what life will look like outside the walls of that orphanage and then continue to put a life plan together that they can live out whoever it is that God has called them to be beyond the title of orphan. And that's, that's, that's what we want to do. We want to we wanna walk beside her in doing that. The, the, um, the Cox family is in Romania, and they've been in Romania for years. And, and if, you've, if you watch the news or you know any, if you've kind of been observant to things that are going on around the world, you know, Romania and a lot of the Eastern European countries that have this influx of Muslim refugees. And so what, what Dave Cox and his family are doing is they're, they're right there in the midst of all of that. And they're, they're, they're working with these Muslim refugees and they're introducing these Muslim refugees to Jesus Christ. And they've started a discipleship process of growing them in their faith in Christ. An amazing thing that's going on. The Skinners, the Skinners who are in Honduras, one of the things I love about and, and one of my values when it comes to missions is that I don't believe in mission tourism. I don't believe we just hop around to different places just for the sake of hopping around. I think we got to root ourselves. Just like you and I root ourselves in a community, we root ourselves in a community overseas as well. And we invest and we pour into those communities. And that's exactly what the Skinners are doing. And they are pouring into that community. They've continued to pour in that, into that community. And, and, and to, to the point where now, instead of being an unchurched community, it is a community that is being discipled and growing in their faith with Christ to the point where, and this again, this is with our, with our proposed budget, we want to help him do this. They've got two young men in this community who he, he has walked beside and discipled and, and, and journeyed into this faith. And these two young men are ready now to go and share their faith as they are being called to be missionaries. So these two Hondurans, we want to send them to a school that is on the border of Paraguay and Uruguay. It's a missionary school. And after they finish up that school, it's a two-year program. After they finish up that school, they will go to Jordan, the country Jordan. And they will, they will work alongside of a Bedouin tribe in introducing those people to the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. That's a bold, audacious faith. And and that's what we get to be a part of here at the church. And we can celebrate that and be be grateful that God has called us to be a part of what he's doing in the world. So they're doing risk-taking mission for the sake of the gospel. And we want to ensure that that work continues. So one of the things is what Pastor Scott likes to do at the beginning of our, of our, our, our um, pledge campaign is to think about missions. And, and so we always, we've had this number that we've thrown out. And so the outreach team, we, we kind of were kind of commissioned to come up with this and what it would look like. And so we, what we decided is we want to, we want to make sure that the operational expenses of those three missionary families in Honduras, Romania, and so, and, and so we want to make sure that they are supported. So for $48.82 Per family, if you gave $48.82 as a family, we will ensure that their operating costs are taken care of. So if anything else happens, because, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the Methodist church. But if anything else happens in the life of the Methodist church, we know that they are taken care of. We know that they will have food on their table. We know their power utility bills will be taken care of, that their insurance will be paid. And all of that operating costs of what it costs to run their ministry will be taken care of if every family in the church could commit to $48.82. And so that's something that we want to do. We want to we just up front take care of that um, before we even talk about how God is going to take care of us as a church. So for $48.82, we will ensure that these families will have their basic needs taken care of so that they can, they can stay focused on what it is that God has called them to be a part of. As we move forward as a congregation, we want to meet the needs of those that God has put in front of us. And so one of the things that we're going to do is once this proposed budget is finalized, you will get a one-sheet page from the outreach team, and it will show you exactly where every penny will go and to what mission and where and exactly what project or what particular um, opportunity it is that, that we are funding and that particular partner that we have. And so we will be able to, so I, I, I believe in being, as in, I think it's a matter of integrity to be apparent or to be transparent and authentic and all of that. And I, wanna, I want 
I want you to see it. I want you to know what you are doing and how you are partnering with God in the world. But our hope is not that we just meet physical needs. We all long that our community and that our world experience the forgiveness that is offered in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the provider. Jesus is the healer. But he's also the son of God. Instead of, instead of just treating him as a man that needs to be healed, Jesus treats him as someone like us who needs to be restored back to a right relationship with God. You see, Jesus isn't just concerned about his healing. He's concerned about wholeness. And by offering this man forgiveness, Jesus is bridging the gap that existed between this man and God. It's a gap that some of us don't even realize exists. And like Reynold Price and, and I'm sure like the four friends who came to Jesus to have their friend healed, we think that sometimes what ails us the most is physical or social or economic. But what we really need is forgiveness. And maybe the first step to your wholeness and my wholeness, even beyond the physical, is forgiveness. All around the globe, on this World Communion Sunday, congregations will gather around a table of forgiveness. Some will be handed a wafer. Others will have cubes of bread. And many will be like us and take a, a tear from a common loaf. Some will drink from one cup. Others will get those little small shot glass looking cups. Others will be just like us and take one cup and dip it into the, the bread into the cup. And regardless of how you, they do it and regardless of how we do it, Regardless of how we participate in worship, we all have one need, and that's forgiveness. And God's answer is a table of grace. Today, we all are invited to bring that one need of forgiveness to this table of grace. And he tells us in 1 John 1, 7, that he'll meet us right here and forgive us of those sins and cleanse us of those sins as we repent of those sins. But I don't want it to stop there. Regardless of your politics, regardless of where you stand on all these issues and the craziness that exists in our world, can we all just agree that we need a little bit more kindness in our world? Can we say, <laughs> okay, can we all at least agree to that, that we need some kindness in our world, right? And we've, we've been shown kindness through the love of Christ. You know, you know and when we weren't kind, very kind, God showed kindness to us, and he continues to show kindness to us. We're going we're gonna to make available as you leave today these kindness cards, and they're in packs of five. So if you feel like you can be kind to more than five people, then take, you know, take more. But we'll have more next week. And, you know, so if five, five acts of kindness is your max this week, then, you know, maybe just take five, and then you can work up to 20 by the end of the, this series. But I want to challenge you to show kindness. To, and as, as forgiven and reconciled people, to share the love of God with those in this Gainesville community. I, wanna, I want us to spread kindness throughout the streets of Gainesville. It, it could be to buy someone a cup of coffee. It, it could be to take your neighbor's trash out, but make sure they got it in their trash bins outside of their house. Don't go like in their house and get it and take it out. But it, it could be to give a ride to someone who needs a ride. It could be sharing a pencil at school. I, I don't know what that is. And I don't know what it is in your context, but, but, but you know and the Lord knows, and God will continue to speak that into you. If you have a cool experience, if you have a cool story, something that happens, I don't, I don't care to know it was you. I don't care. And these cards won't identify you. 
All these cards identify that you serve a God who shows kindness to you and you want to repay that kindness to others. And that's what you're sharing with others. But I do want to know, like, if, if there's a story, that, an encounter that happens over the next four weeks that, that you think would be an encouragement to other people, that you think would be an encouragement to the church and, and to, to the witness of what God is doing in our community, then I would encourage you to go to our website. And, and Aaron has created a, a page on our website where you can share that story. And it's gfumc.com slash your story. And so as you, as you encounter and have these experiences, or maybe there's a kindness act that is done towards you, then you want to just share that. And maybe there's an ideas. Maybe there's ideas out there that you can say, you know what, here's one way that maybe somebody might not think about. Here's a way to share kindness. And so I'd love for you to go to that website and share that and tell those stories. And finally, if you're in need of forgiveness, the truth be told, we're all in need of forgiveness. But if you've never experienced the forgiving grace of Jesus Christ, I would love to talk to you about that. I want to share with you how you can walk in wholeness through forgiveness. That you don't have to walk in shame or you don't have to walk in guilt. That you can actually walk in wholeness through the forgiveness that is offered in Jesus Christ. So as we receive communion this morning, I will be available to pray with you and to spend some time in prayer with you. And I would love to do that. So today we begin a journey. A a journey of discovering what happens when the church lives out generosity and transforming lives and communities by building bridges to Jesus Christ. This is going to be an exciting few weeks as we tell personally the stories like you just saw with Katie. And as we share experiences that happen through the kindness experiment that we're all going to be a part of over the next few weeks. So I'm excited to be with you along this journey. So let's pray. Gracious God, we are grateful for your presence here today. We are grateful for your love and your kindness that you have shown to us. We pray that you will give us the courage to live out a bold and audacious faith in this community and around the world. That, Lord, you will help us to be creative in how we live out our faith. That we will see others as you see them children of God and that we will extend kindness as those who've received kindness in the name of Jesus we pray amen